Now I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Martina Castro and Laura Macumba who make Duolingo's podcast. Martina and Laura, welcome and please introduce yourselves. Hi Helen, I'm Laura uh, coming at you from Brooklyn, New York and I'm the supervising producer of Duolingo's three language podcasts uh, and oversee the team of brilliant uh, language scientists and creative producers who help bring this together uh, along with Martina's team. And I'm Martina, I'm uh, in Los Angeles, California, and I'm the executive producer of the podcasts that we make at Adonde Media with Duolingo, and also happen to be the host of Duolingo Spanish. So you said three podcasts, tell us uh, what they are. So they're Duolingo Spanish, Duolingo French, and re a recent uh, release of Relatos en Inglés, which internally is like Duolingo English for native Spanish speakers. And how did you decide on the format of these shows? Because they're not what people would expect of language learning audio when it was like, press a tape and then read along. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, we have the Duolingo app, which is a really excellent way for beginners to start getting their footing in a new language and, um, you know, walk, working their way through vocabulary and grammar exercises. Uh, but at a certain level in your learning journey, you really start to get hungry for uh, longer form content. So reading and listening and um, the team at Duolingo came up with a brilliant idea back in 2017 to pursue a podcast where you can actually practice your immersive listening. And um, what better way to do that than through narrative storytelling? So I think, Martina, I don't know how involved your team was in the uh, actual ideation of how we came up with the format and the type of narrative we tell, but I'd love to hear a little from you in terms of how that came together. Yeah, no, I mean, we worked on it for a good four months. Um, I know that there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes at Duolingo, a lot of testing internally and like even with potential users and listeners. Um, but it really just the, 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 the germ of the idea was, oh, we love the type of storytelling on This American Life. It's so engaging. What if you could listen to a podcast of that caliber narratively and then passively be practicing your language skills. So, I mean, that was the beginning. And, you know, the first iteration, actually, one day we should come, you know, dig it up because I remember the first iteration being a lot less intervention from the host. And then at some point, we got to this nice balance of like basically 30 seconds of the native language of the person who's speaking, spoken to by the host. So, the, the podcasts are for native English speakers. So, the host speaking in native English, and then the storyteller picking it up in the target language. In the first podcast, it was Spanish. Um, and then like that was just getting to that format of the, the two voices. And then it, it took on a new level of complexity to figure out the simplification. What level of Spanish was just right to hit the target audience, but also to not sound too simple. Um, so yeah, it was like a, it was a long process. Uh, but um, I think what's so beautiful about the beginning that has lasted through this whole time is that the protagonists are the people who lived those stories. So it's really anchored in journalism. I mean, it's anchored in the world that I come from. You know, I'm a public radio journalist in a former life. And so um, that true authenticity of the story and the voice is maintained throughout. And, um, and it's definitely harder to produce this podcast with that way. But um, that has now been a, a hallmark of our of all the podcasts that we make uh, so far. And how do you work with the speakers? If they're not people who are used to talking about themselves on mic, are there processes that you use to get them comfortable with, you know, bearing their souls? <laughs> I think that this is um, another like huge testament to our team. You know, I think people rarely know how many people are involved in this process. And we have like a protagonist whisperer. His name is Mariano Pachela. He's like the guy who really established our workflow with people who didn't know how to, um, how to feel comfortable in front of a microphone. I mean, that is actually what happens most of the time. These are people who have never spoken in front of a microphone before and we get them in this fancy studio and they get very, very clammy and, and intimidated. And so he, um, he makes, he makes it a game. He's very open about how weird this is. Like, I know this is weird, but you know, let's try it. And, um, and the idea is to make it as fun as possible. Like the technical part is a part of it, especially now 
that we're having people record themselves at home, it's become a bigger part of it. And that can really be a stumbling block for people because we're guiding them into how to uh, record themselves without, you know, and making a, a really good sounding recording. But it's more psychological than technical. It's like making people feel like this is fun, like this is um, a positive experience. There's never a negative word said like, oh, that was great. Let's try it again. You know, it's never like that was not so great. Let's do it again. You know what I mean? It's a very different attitude. Um, and we model a lot. So I think like that role of the person who is guiding the protagonist through hours of recording, OK, like a 20 minute piece. Um, which our episodes tend to be on um, on Spanish and French, three to six hours sometimes. Um, and it's literally one by one going and modeling what they need to say, and then they'll repeat it. And then especially like getting emotional responses is the hardest part because you just, it, like a person who isn't an actor, <laughs> it's hard to say, okay, now you need to sound sad. <laughs> like. Not good. So, you know, again, modeling um, and just re repetition, revisiting things later. It's it's a whole dance. And that's why I, I really feel like protagonist whisperer should be part of because Mariano has been the one who's really figured it out. And then we've modeled all the other coaching sessions based on his ability to figure it out in Spanish. Um, and uh, and yeah, th hopefully by the end they're excited and they've had a fun time and it's been a special experience. So you've mentioned you have a protagonist whisperer. Who else is working on the show with you? Because, I mean, maybe this is my personal bitterness coming out. I think a lot of people think, oh, I'm making a podcast. It's easy. You just stick a mic in front of your face. It comes out as is done. If only. Well, some of them. <laughs> I'm not going to knock the ones where it is that easy. Sometimes it is. Lovely and for them. There are... I'm very happy for them. Yeah. Good for them. So much leisure More... time they must have. <laughs> I know. I know. I know they just sit down, open a mic, but that's uh, clearly not what we make. Uh, I mean, Laura can attest to this. Like each story has, we've gotten this down to a better science, but it's takes about two and a half months to produce each story if everything goes according to plan. Um, we've got a team on our side of Adonde of producers, editors, um, sound designers, um, uh, and then people like within those jobs, they are booking studios, they are coaching and and interacting with the protagonist. We're script writing, we're writing outlines. And then we interact with Laura's team, who's also I mean, Laura, I'll leave you to describe your team. I mean, I think by the end, we have like a team of like maybe 20 people who end up touching a, a given script. Yeah, I really appreciate this question, Helen, because um, there, when you actually count how many people touch each episode of the podcast, I mean, it's in the dozens, I think. Um, but maybe let me talk through process really quickly, and then I can talk about how the Duolingo team works um, on our side and how we interact with the Don Day. But really, there's a few stages here, right? We have to, Martina's team pitches us um, lots of amazing story ideas, and our team approves you know, stories we think would be really interesting to our audience um, based on a number of different factors, like uh, is there a good editorial balance for the season? Are we telling, you know, the the hardship stories alongside the stories of brightness and success? And, um, you know, are we featuring uh, many voices and corners of the world and people of different genders and backgrounds? So we're thinking about all those things as we approve these stories. Once the stories are approved, um, Martina's team they actually interview the protagonists, make sure they get all the details of the story right. Um, you know, they write a preliminary script that our team then reviews. And it's only at that point that then the language goes through a special simplification process. Um, and that's where we really hit this sweet spot, this intermediate level of language that we aim for in the podcast, because, you know, you can go watch telenovelas or you can watch the news and uh, on French TV stations, but if you're an intermediate learner, that's going to be really challenging. So we simplify the language down, we send the scripts back to Martina's team, and then her team does the in-studio recording that she was just telling you about. Um, at which point, in within that process, we do something called a brain trust review. So my team is made up of members of what we call the brain trust, and it's this really special part of the process where um, People with various roles at Duolingo come together and they uh, listen to a rough mix of the episode. And so 
there's a lot of reasons for this, but one of this is just to really simulate the listening experience for our learners, to put ourselves in their shoes and, um, and see what it's like to listen to the episode all the way through. We have um, learning scientists who are part of this team. We have members of our marketing team, um, creative producers. We have people who are actually learning the languages inside of the podcast that they're listening to so they can put themselves in the learner's shoes. Um, and it's this really special hour of the day where we talk about, is the story working? Do people feel hooked? Like, is a, is a language choice too complex? You know, are, we, are people really going to get that? Is that too colloquial? Like all these debates that we're debating in the comments section with um, Martina's team, making decisions about, uh, and then we kick the script back over to them and they produce like the most beautiful sound design, polished episode that you can ever imagine. And, and like Martina said, that takes two and a half months at, at least for one episode, so. Are there certain things that you have decided that you don't do, certain construction, certain vocabulary that you think you can't make work in a simplified version of language? What are the limitations? So another really good question. Uh, what's really special, again, about our team is that we have these learning scientists who use the same framework for our podcast that we use inside the app. So there is really a correspondence between your uh, app experience as a Duolingo learner and the podcast experience. Once you get to a certain point uh, in your Duolingo app journey, um, you know, you get to what these what our learning scientists can measure as an intermediate level um, and we have people who are trained to take the scripts that adonde puts together and these scripts are based on real life interviews where our protagonists are speaking naturally the way they speak and uh, our simplifiers use the same framework that we use inside the app uh, to make sure that they're choosing vocabulary and choosing sentence structures that our learners would have been exposed to. So it's a really specific and amazing skill that I certainly could not do myself. Um, and, you know, there are certain choices sometimes, like that's why we, we decide things by committee a lot because, you know, our simplifiers will um, we'll pick a word that's within the curriculum that we know and have approved at Duolingo. Um, but, you know, when we're listening to the episode, we might still decide that it's too challenging or that we need our English speaking host to introduce it to listeners um, and add a little more context around it. So there's a, a lot of different decisions that are being made the whole time, but there is a very established academic framework for you know how we actually get the language to a level where intermediate learners are ready for it. I, I wanted to chime in because I, I'm imagining that people might not know what this sounds like. I think that given everything that Laura just said, it's also important to keep in mind, we're trying to do this as subtly as possible so that you will never know that this is what's happening. Um, so what if I, if a ho as host, I come in to like clarify a word, we really try not to do, you know, uh, la mesa, la mesa is, you know, like is a, you know, we, we don't like do the, like, I'm a teacher mode. Um, and I think that that's just so key to why this podcast is special is because we weave it in. I mean, the editing process is so different. Like people who have worked on podcasts and told first person narratives have to learn all over again how to work with us because we are actually trying to very subtly reinforce language, introduce topics um, and concepts and, and new vocab, and then also make sure that the plot points aren't lost for anyone who might not be like as advanced as another listener. And so um, I just I just feel like if, if you imagine all of this happening behind the scenes and the fact that hopefully listeners don't even know it's happening, it's it, that's the, the ideal that we're looking for. So a podcast has potentially a global audience and yours indeed does have listeners all over the world, but there are so many different versions of a language like Spanish and not only national and not only differences between different countries versions of Spanish, but within a country, there are all these variations of pronunciation or very localized idioms. So how do you deal with all of that? So we, I, we certainly have the most global audience I think you could imagine. Uh, we have listeners in almost every country. I mean, people are listening to the Spanish podcast in Syria and uh, you know South Africa and it's, um, so that's really amazing. And 
Uh, part of our ethos is really, you know, we want we feature as many different kinds of Spanish and French um, and now English within the podcast as we can. So, you know, I think inside the app, you're being exposed to a kind of standard um, accent of uh, the languages that you're learning. But when real people speak, they come from all these different cultural contexts and regions and um, and social classes. And so um, we, we, you know, it's a challenge because we, we have to meet our learners where they are and we, we don't want to lose them. We want them with us the whole way. Um, but we also want to take this as an opportunity to help them be exposed to different ways of speaking and different accents. Um, so we have a couple of different tricks for this. You know, I think uh, as much as possible, we, we use our simplification experts to pick the word choice that's just going to be the most simple and direct for people. But sometimes we we really take an opportunity to teach someone a, a slang word or an expression that they wouldn't be exposed to. Um, I was thinking actually, Martina, of an episode that we're working on right now um, about Nepal leather. And there's a, a track in there where they say, um, you know, instead of saying the word dinero for money, we say uh, lana. And is that right? And yeah, yeah. Um, and so we're saying to people, you know, um, as they say in Mexican Spanish, lana, which means money. And so we're really, you know, we're showing a word that's uh, Mexican Spanish and we're calling it out. And we're that's our like kind of teaching moment to listeners. And it's culturally engaging. And um, and so we do that. We make choices like that. Um, I think the other thing we do is, you know, we believe and accept that everyone has an accent. There's no one way to speak a language, but we will, um, you know, caveat at the beginning of certain episodes. If someone has a certain way of speaking, um, we w we just want people to know what to listen for and really like get their their ear attuned. So when they enter into uh, an episode with an Argentine speaker, for example, um, you know, they they know what to listen for. And I'll, I'll let Martina maybe talk us through how we address because I can't uh, I can't address the specific accent point, but Martina, maybe you can kind of tell the audience how we like phrase these things at the beginning of episodes. Yeah, I mean, I think this is probably the part that is most language class of the whole episode. It's literally 10 seconds at the end, at the end of the sort of, we have a cold open and then we have present the show. At the end of that presentation of the show, we'll say, and today's protagonist comes from Argentina. There, instead of saying pollo, they say pollo. Um, I'm able to like imitate that one because I'm from Uruguay when we have the same accent. Um, but then, you know, we've we've really been evolving our way to make sure people can clue into how that difference is, um, especially on the English uh, podcast and on Relatos en Inglés, we're featuring British English, um, Canadian, um, Australian. So, I mean, the same one word, as we all know, can sound so different. Um, so really prepping uh, the listener for that. Um, we have our host say it in her accent and then have the protagonist say that same word in their accent. But then also thinking about uh, words that have been borrowed into the English language, like a lot of place names, how do you decide whether you're going to pronounce them as they would be pronounced more like in their original language or in the localized English pronunciation? It's a nightmare. This has been really hard. We, <laughs> been... I've, there's a really, I feel like a very funny back and forth we got into about this very thing um, on the English podcast because we had a protagonist whose last name was Rodriguez, but he was of um, Filipino descent and American. And we have a native Spanish speaking host in the English podcast because it's for a Spanish audience. And so there was this big debate over does she pronounce Rodriguez with a Spanish accent because it is a Hispanic name or but you know the protagonist himself said it with an American accent so we really went back and forth on this it was a confusing decision to make and you know ultimately we decided to um, pronounce it in a way that was going to be least jarring for our audience I think that the a lot you know we have several people from Latin America on our team who help us make these decisions. And, and Martina, too, I think your team felt like it's just going to sound really jarring to the audience if we don't say this word they're very familiar with and an accent they recognize. There was an episode of yours I was listening to the other day where um, the speaker he was talking in Spanish, but then occasionally just dropping the word sandwich 
<laughs> wow. wow, where did that come from? Oh my gosh, that's a whole other thing. Like, because we have a Spanish accent for the way we say English words. So, like, you know, is it, um, what's the word? Is it podcast or podcast? Like, that's actually different. And we, we debate that, you know, like, should the NSA escucha el podcast or escucha el podcast? You know, I mean, it just sounds so different. <laughs> so this is like the, this is my favorite part. It's like these little things are what betray like how non-exact language is. And I think that that's important for learners to eventually be exposed to. And I think Duolingo does a really great job of like doing that in a measured way. So it's not overwhelming. Um, but this is the truth. This is how language is. It's a, it's a very slippery beast. But then when you're being taught it at school, it feels like, oh, it's all enshrined in books and you can just learn it and it's a machine without deviation. Exactly. And then you're introducing these ideas that that is a lie, which it is, <laughs> is a lie. Uh, but then how do you square it with people who are learning and mm -hmm. yet you have to intimate to them that if they throw in this word, it may not help them in, say, a, an official school test. Right. I don't know if Laura, yeah. you have any other I thoughts don't know on that. If I have a, quite an answer for that, except that that's we, their problem. <laughs> I mean, I think. Well, I was gonna say, I we we do a lot of trusting of our listeners to you know they what they're learning inside the app is very much you know follows a, a standard framework um, of the help people learn a language because you need scaffolding, you need um, to really kind of build these skills level by level, right, and, and accumulate um, vocabulary and, and grammar um, and become increasingly complex. But then it's, you know, I really think it's similar to um, learning how to become a good storyteller. You know, you, there are these rules that you learn and then the more you learn them, the more you can break them. And the more you realize that the rules are just there as a starting point to help you grow and grow your creativity and grow your understanding of something. So I really think that we trust our learners to, as they grow in their language learning journey, you know, we're just giving them more information and knowledge and they get to choose what they do with that. And that's really exciting. And then some concepts are really hard to translate or not yet actually translatable. So for instance, if you had a scenario where you wanted to express somebody's gender-free pronouns, but you had to do it in a language that at the moment is fully binary gendered, what do you do? Yeah, I can. So we, we actually haven't had that particular scenario yet, though it's one uh, I would really look forward to working on and thinking through. I know that, um, you know, we think a lot about um, gender identity in the podcast and um, and always respecting our protagonists no matter what context they're coming out of. And most recently we had a really interesting script we were working on in the French podcast about um, a Canadian a transgender man who transitions um, during the course of the episode. But, you know, he wanted to use his he, him pronouns in the story the whole time. Um, the story, however, starts back when this protagonist is female presenting. So there was definitely some complications around, you know, how we respect the desires of the protagonist while making sure that our um, our audience who were, already has a, a big cognitive load they're taking on when they turn on each episode, you know, they're here to listen to the story, but they're also here to, you know, they're practicing their uh, language immersion and their listening skills. And some people might be early intermediate and some people might be much farther along and they're uh, in their learning. So, um, you know, it's really, uh, it's, it's a challenge to figure out how you meet the needs of your imagined audience, um, along with the needs of your protagonist. And in this case, I'm just really proud of how the script turned out. We, we used he, him pronouns the whole time. Um, and we just tried to be as clear as possible, often in host tracks. This is where having the English speaking host, uh, is really valuable just kind of come in and, and help prompt the audience a little bit on that listening journey and remind them that, oh, now we're talking about when this character was uh, female presenting still, even though we're using the he, him pronouns. Um, so that's that's one example of how we keep thinking things through. And, um, you know, I think another example that came up in uh, our in Relatos in Inglés recently also was um, around the term Latinx. 
And um, I think we ended up actually explaining that inside of the uh, podcast episode, which maybe Martina, you can give a little more context around that for us in terms of the Latin American audience. Yeah, it's, it's a term that's developed in the United States to make a, gen, a gender-free reference to Latinos uh, because, you know, as you know, we, it is a gendered language. So it's either Latinos or Latinas. So Latinx has evolved to be gender-free, but it's not a term widely used in Latin America. So we had to, it, we could have not used it, but I'm really glad that we decided to keep it in and teach our audience about it, that this is actually a way that you might be identified if you come to the United States, like that this is a term for Latinos, Latinas. Um, I think we've we've also, you know, tried to, when we can, be as inclusive as possible. So Diana doesn't just say bienvenidos. She says bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Um, so, you know, we also, there are ways to use vocab. And I think this is where it's so important that um, our storytellers and our you know, in our work with the linguists on Duolingo that we have a really like broad command of the language that there are vocab words that are gen are not gendered. So uh, one example is, is like alumnos. Alumnos y alumnas is uh, students. But you could also say estudiantes. Estudiantes is not gendered. Uh, and so we're looking for, we, we do go the extra step to like see how can we use vocab that isn't gendered and also, you can say a thing in a way where you don't have to use the gendered uh, adjective. So instead of like, I'm sure I would stumble through this example. It's not a, but like something like instead of they went, you know, they did this, they are this thing. They are people who do this thing. Um, so instead of they are architects, which would say, we, you would say in Spanish, son arquitectos or arquitectas, you would say, Son uh, personas que ejercen arquitectura. You know, well, I, I, not a great example, but you know what I mean. Um, so these are like very, very conscious efforts on our part to be as inclusive as possible. Do you hear from people who just want podcasts in all the languages? They're like, well, I've got Spanish, but I yes. want German, I want Mandarin. <laughs> There's literally so the most common do. comment on social media, I think. Like literally we, we could share anything on Twitter and the comment will be, but what about Portuguese <laughs> or what about, and I, I mean, I feel like that's a very common Duolingo thing, right? Oh yeah. And you know, we, I, the, I think Martina hit this on the nose earlier when she said, okay, here's how much effort and time and you can assume money goes into producing these episodes that we want you to feel like are effortless to listen to. So, um, you know, there's certainly plans and we're thinking all the time about where we want to go and what we want to do next. Um, but we can't just like reach into our back pocket and and whip out an amazing German language podcast. It, you know, it takes a little more time than that. So are there any new projects that you have coming up? Yes, we are really, really excited to announce that Duolingo is producing its first ever true crime miniseries. And uh, this is going to be a part of the Duolingo Spanish podcast. The next season will be a fully serialized six episode season that centers on a very compelling story. and. Uh, Martina, I'll let you say the, the title of this uh, mini series with your beautiful accent that I will butcher. Yes, it's going to be called El Gran Robo Argentino or The Great Argentine Heist. Uh, we have just loved working on this. Uh, we have such a stellar team uh, putting it together and it's a really nice challenge to start you know, flexing our creative muscle in a different way on the podcast. So uh, we're, we just can't wait to share it with everybody. Well, thank you so much, Martina and Laura, for telling us about your work. And I think we've got a trailer for the new show. Do you want to just introduce it? And now, without further ado, the trailer for The Great Argentine Heist. Noon, January 13th, 2006. Five men enter a bank in a wealthy neighborhood of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Inside, they approach a bank teller. 
Then they pull out weapons and tell everyone to drop to the floor. Había varios clientes dentro del banco y todos tenían mucho miedo. Parecía un robo express. Police rush to the scene. But soon, it's clear this isn't an ordinary bank holdup. And these are not ordinary thieves or ladrones. This robbery is something else. Todo se veía muy desorganizado. Los ladrones habían desaparecido. This fall, for the first time ever, we bring you a special serialized season of the Duolingo Spanish podcast. It's called El Gran Robo Argentino, The Great Argentine Heist. Over six episodes, we'll be telling the true story behind the most shocking bank robbery in the history of Latin America. A sophisticated crime that stumped investigators and journalists alike. You'll hear directly from the men and women who reported on it, investigated it, and even took part in it. Thieves who disappeared into thin air the day of the robbery, along with a fortune worth $20 million. La cantidad de dinero que podíamos obtener era interesante, pero esa no era mi verdadera motivación. Yo quería cometer el robo más grande del mundo para finalizar mi carrera de toda la vida. El Gran Robo Argentino launches on October 22nd and will feature our signature mix of English and intermediate Spanish. Subscribe now to the Duolingo Spanish podcast so you don't miss a single episode. I'm Martina Castro, host and executive producer of the podcast. Los esperamos in Buenos Aires.